Greetings everyone. Back with another video for you for anyone who's interested. Today we're going to have a look, closer look at the relationship between crows and the crown and in particular we'll examine the myth theme of the ravens of the Tower of London. The crow itself is a symbol of royalty par excellence. I believe that with this universal reset called the coronavirus or COVID-19 we're being positioned into a world monarchy of a neo -feudal, of a neo and a neo-feudal system. It is ruled by the eunuch slash tranny. The coronavirus is the crowning of the tranny elite and the crow plays a key part in its symbology as we shall see. There is no consistent distinction between crows and ravens except for their size, ravens being the largest of the corvid family. Collective nouns for a flock of ravens include an unkindness, a treachery, or a conspiracy. Tradition has it that there is a group of at least six captive ravens resident at the Tower of London. Their presence is traditionally believed to protect the crown and the tower. A superstition holds that if the Tower of London ravens are lost or fly away, the crown will fall and Britain with it. Sometimes the legend tells of a required six, sometimes there are seven. Regardless, there is a conspiracy of ravens kept at the tower. These two ravens here are called Jubilee and Munin. Munin is the name of one of Odin's crow spies described in the Edas. Munin means memory. Today, Queen Elizabeth II is the living embodiment of, quote, the crown, unquote. <clears throat> the White Tower within the Tower of London is home of the crown jewels of England. They are 142 royal ceremonial objects kept at the Tower of London, which include the regalia and vestments worn at the coronations of British kings and queens. This royal regalia is of extraordinary religious and cultural significance. Symbols of 800 years of monarchy, the coronation regalia are the only working set in Europe. Here's the jewel tower at the Tower of London in 1873. The Tower of London is an historic castle located in the north bank of the River Thames in central London, in Tower Hamlets. It is a UNESCO World Heritage Site, which to my mind screams fraud and deception. Supposedly, it was founded towards the end of 1066 as part of the Norman conquest of England. The White Tower was built by William the Conqueror in 1078 and was, re was a resented symbol of oppression inflicted upon London by the new ruling elite. This is what I call cartoon history. The White Tower is a central tower the old keep at the Tower of London. A keep is a type of fortified tower built within castles during the Middle Ages. Fortified residences used as a refuge of last resort should the rest of the castle fall under siege. Sort of early uh, panic room. The Tower Ravens are tended by the Raven Master of the Yeoman Warders called Bee Feeders. This is the current Raven Master called Chris Scaife in front of Trader's Gate. And I believe Chris Scaife is appropriately a tea drinker. In 2011, Scaife became Raven Master at the Tower of London, where he is responsible for seven ravens. The number 11 is all over this story. And there he is with his T-Rex arms, of course. Scaife is a retired staff sergeant and former drum major with the Princess of Wales Royal Regiment. The Princess of Wales Royal Regiment was formed in 1992 
named in honor of Diana, Princess of Wales. Wales and wealth mythology play a significant role in the English crown and beyond, as we shall see. In 2018, Scaife published The Raven Master, My Life with the Ravens at the Tower of London. You could call him the keeper of the conspiracy. I thought I could play this, but maybe we'll just skip it. Some historians, including the Tower's official historian, believe that the Tower's Ravens, the Tower's Raven mythology is likely to be a Victorian flight of fancy. Were the legends that gave them special importance entirely fabricated by the tourist industry of the Tower? or did they begin outside the tower in oral traditions? American author Borea Sachs believes the ravens of the tower to be an invented tradition. In the article, How Ravens Came to the Tower of London, Sachs came to the conclusion that the ravens were originally brought to in to dramatize the alleged site of executions at the tower. <coughs> this is... Um, a large black plas, plaque stating, On this site stood a scaffold on which were executed seven illustrious prisoners. And these are the seven prisoners, including Lady Jane Grey, Catherine Howard, and Anne Boleyn. Each of these individuals was beheaded with an axe, except for Anne Boleyn, who was beheaded with a sword. The bodies of all seven were buried at the chapel of St. Peter ad Vincula. The tourist attraction began in 16, 1861 when Prince Albert, on a visit to the tower, had remarked that the Queen would like to see the site of Anne Boleyn's execution. This was not the actual site but a stone marking the site was set up in front of the chapel nonetheless. In this drawing we can see that the ravens were from the very beginning used to dramatize accounts of executions, as proverbial birds of doom who gather at scaffolds to eat human flesh. This is the Chapel Royal of St. Peter ad Vincula, which means St. Peter in Chains. The name refers to St. Peter's imprisonment under Herod Agrippa in Jerusalem. The existing building was rebuilt for Henry VIII by Sir Richard Chumley in 1520, but we are assured that a chapel stood in its position since before the Norman Conquest. The House of Tudor was an English royal house of Welsh origin, descended from the Tudors of Penmin Penminnydd, in Anglesey, North Wales. The Tudors succeeded the House of Plantagenet as rulers of the Kingdom of England and were succeed succeeded by the House of Stuart. But who was Sir Richard Chumley? He served as Lieutenant of the Tower of London during the reign of Henry the Eighth. He was responsible for the rebuilding of the Chapel of St. Peter at Vincula. He is remembered because of his tomb at the Tower of London, and because he is a fictionalized character in Gilbert and Sullivan's darkly comic opera, The Yeoman of the Guard, in 1888. Here is a 15th century depiction of the White Tower. Ravens, as, as scavengers, were notorious for congregating at scenes of carnage such as scaffolds and battlefields. In fact, the executioner's block had been known as a ravenstone. Here's Anne Boleyn. By the 19th century, ravens at the scaffold had become somewhat of a cliché.
Japanese modernist author Natsume Soseki suggests in his 1906 novel that, uh, called The Tower of London, that the seven ravens of the tower were reincarnated souls of those executed there. However, this novel wasn't published in English until 2004. In this story, the Tower Green is haunted by the shape-shifting Lady Jane Grey. She is the beautiful young queen of great learning and courage, who ruled England for nine days before being executed on the orders of Mary Tudor. Legend has it that the ravens of the Tower during, during the execution of Lady Jane Grey in 1554 pecked the eyes from the severed head of the queen. She is fictionalized as the Raven Queen in this child's children's book. Boria Sachs believes that perhaps Sosaki identified Lady Jane Grey with Ama Terasu, the Japanese goddess of the sun, from whom the emperors of Japan claim their descent. Both are strongly associated with the Raven. In Japan, the crows and ravens are embodiments of the warrior, the ninja, and servants to Amaterasu, the supreme goddess of the sun and matron of the emperors. This is a raven warrior. While the Ravens may have been brought to the Tower of London as a sort of marketing ploy for the House of Horror's reputation of the Tower of London. The relationship between Ravens and the British public is complex and deserves a closer look as to its mythic dimensions. We'll do this by looking at history not for facts, but for narrative. Another origin myth of the Tower Ravens involves Charles II of England. According to popular belief, Charles once heard a prophecy that if ravens left the Tower of London, it would fall, so he ordered that the wings of seven ravens in the tower be trimmed. We've been hearing a lot about Charles II of England lately. His coronation on May 29, 1660, marked the beginning of the restoration of England's monarchy following the Republic of Oliver Cromwell. It's called Restoration Day more commonly known as Apple Oak Day, or Oak Apple Day. This is in reference to the occasion after the Battle of Worcester in 1651, when Charles II escaped Cromwell's roundhead army by hiding in an oak tree near Bosco Bell House. There are accounts that trace the name Druid to Duir, the Celtic term for the oak, more interestingly, the actual translation of Duir is Dor, and lore indicates the spiritually advanced Celts would access the ethereal planes of higher thought or psychic vision by opening the oak door. Ancient Druids met in forests of oak groves. One etymology of the word Druid comes from Druid, which means knower of oak trees. There is a deep connection between royalty and Welsh Druidism, as we shall continue to see. Oak trees are also well-known light, lightning rods. In another version of the story, John Flamsteed, Charles II's royal astronomer, is involved. According to one legend, John Flamsteed complained to Charles II that wild ravens were flying past his telescope and making it harder for him to observe the sky from his observatory in the White Tower. Flamsteed requested that the birds be removed, but Charles refused to comply with this request, knowing full well what would befall the crown if he did. The White Tower has three square turrets and one circular originally built to accommodate a circular staircase and access to the roof. In 1675 it became Britain's first temporary royal observatory when Flamsteed was appointed royal astronomer. Today it is still known as Flamsteed's turret. 
Another variation of the legend says it was Charles II himself who disliked the wild raven's droppings falling onto the telescope. In this version the king complained, "'These ravens must go.' "'But, sire, it is very unlucky to kill a raven,' replied Flamsteed. "'If you do, the tower will fall, and you will lose your kingdom, having only just got it back.' Charles, being a pragmatist, thought for a moment and said, "'The observatory must go to Greenwich, and the ravens can stay in the tower.' Here is a view of the observatory and a view of Greenwich, Deptford, and London. The observatory was commissioned in 1675 by King Charles, with Flamsteed laying the foundation stone on the 10th of August. So the very origin myth of the Royal Observatory and Greenwich, meantime, is imbued with the raven mytheme. There is something about this name, Charles Stuart. Charles II is from the house of Stuart. Stuart is derived from steward. Let's have a look at Charles's obscure ancestor from Brittany, Walter Fitzalan. Founder, Walter Fitzalan. This is the uh, symbol of the Stuart family. Fifteen white squares, uh, squares and fifteen azure squares. The title of High Steward or Great Steward is that of an officer who controls the domestic affairs of a royal household. Walter Fitzalan was the High Steward of Scotland. He is also called a seneschal. A seneschal is a type of supervisor or administrator in an historic context. Most commonly, a seneschal was a senior position filled by a court, court appointment within a royal or noble household during the Middle Ages, also called a steward or major domo of a medieval great house. So how did the steward become the king? Traditionally, the house of Stuart's progenitor, Walter Fitzalan, was thought to be a descendant from Banquo of Shakespeare's Macbeth. Shakespeare wrote Macbeth during the reign of James I and James VI of Scotland, who was patron of Shakespeare's acting company. Lord Banquo and Lord Macbeth are both generals in the King's army, and together they meet the three witches. After prophesying that Macbeth will, Macbeth will become king, the witches tell Banquo that he will not be, be king himself, but that his descendants will be, through Banquo's son, Fleance, and his royal Welsh wife, the purported parents of Walter. Shakespeare's source for the story is the account of Macbeth, king of Scotland, Macduff, and Duncan, in Holland, Hollandshed's Chronicles of 1587. It was a history of England, Scotland, and Ireland familiar to Shakespeare and his contemporaries. In Hollandshed's Chronicles, Raphael Hollandshed asserted that Banquo, Thane of Lochaber, was the ancestor of the Stuarts. However, Hollandshed's Banquo was presented as Macbeth's chief accomplice, accomplice in regicide. Shakespeare had to morally polish the character of Banquo in order to flatter his patron, patron King James I. This is from Hollandshed's Chronicles. By the early 20th century, it is a Breton knight, Alan Fitzflaud, Walter Fitzalan's great-grandfather, who is finally accepted as the true ancestor of the Stuarts. Alan Fitzflaud, that's F-L-A-A-D, was the son of Alan, seneschal to the ancient diocese of Dole, 
with its sea at Dol de Bretagne, who, was take, who had taken part in the First Crusade in 1097. Dol de Bretagne in Brittany is reputed to be the origin of the royal house of Stuart. This is a plaque in Dol commemorating that origin. Here it is located in Brittany. The area of Dol is near Mont Saint Michel and has figured in the history of the Duchy of Brittany since at least the rule of Nominoe. Mont Saint Michel, the isolated Norman monastery on the Breton border, which King Henry held against his brothers in 1091. Nominoe was the first Duke of Brittany from 846 to his death. He is the Breton Pater Patrie, and to Breton nationalists, he is known as Tad Arvro, Father of the Fatherland. The Stuart monarchs descend from Alan the Seneschal of the Bishop of Dole. His son, the Breton knight, Flad Fitzalan, and his son, Alan, arrived in Britain as mercenaries at the request of Henry I, fourth son of William the Conqueror. Flod's grandson, Walter Fitzalan, was appointed the first steward of Scotland by King David I. Malcolm IV, King David's son, later made the office of steward hereditary in Walter's family. Here is uh, King David of, David of Scotland, with the young gender-bending Malcolm IV, nicknamed Malcolm the Maiden. In the 14th century, Walter Stuart married Marjorie Bruce, daughter of King Robert I of Scotland. Their son became King Robert II, and their descendants the royal house of Stuart. This is the uh, seal of Alain Fitzflad, the Seneschal of Dole. Dole has some in interesting connections to Wales. In 549, the Welsh saint Taylo was documented as coming to Dole, where he joined Samson of Dole, also of Wales, and the fruit groves which they planted remain and are known as the groves of Taylo and Samson. St. Taylor, from the year 500, is also known by his Cornish name, Eliud. He was a British Christian monk. He is acknowledged as the one who undertook extraordinary labors in behalf of the church in Wales and Cornwall, and who is also celebrated in Amorica, which is Brittany and the surrounding provinces. Amorica means place by the sea, and to me it's the clearest etymology to America that I've yet seen. Strong links existed in the 6th century between British and Amorican territories, as can, be, as can be seen in the legend of Tristan and Isolde. The story is a 12th century tragedy about the adulterous love between Cornish knight Tristan and the Irish princess Isolt. St. Taylo is reported to have stayed in Brittany for seven years and seven months. He is frequently represented in many Breton churches as riding a stag. This stag represents his ties to pagan wealth mythology in the form of Anun, or Gwynap Nuth, ruler of the Welsh Otherworld, and lord of the wild hunt. St. Taylor was reputed, uh, reputed to be a cousin and friend and disciple of St. David, or Dewi Sant. Here's St. David with his dove. He is the patron saint of Wales. The dove is foiled to the crow, light versus dark, the reconciliation of opposites. 
St. David is said to be the great nephew of King Arthur through his mother, Non. One of his symbols is the leek. Here is Prince Charles with the leek on St. David's Day. According to legend, St. David ordered Britons to wear leeks in their helmets so that they could recognize each other during the battle with Saxon invaders. Shakespeare's Henry V, Act V, Scene One, commemorates the leek of St. David. This is the flag of St. David. In the Armis Predain, a popular 10th century poem prophesied that in the future, when all might seem lost, the Cymru, the Welsh people, would unite behind the standard of David and defeat the English. Achlumenglan Dewi Adrchvant, and they will rise, and they will raise the pure banner of Dewi. In the, in the five forties, the yellow plague affected Britain. In five forty nine, Taylor joined his compatriot Saint Samson in Dole in Brittany. Samson is counted among the seven founder saints of Brittany from Wales and Britain. Bretons are mainly Catholic, and the Christianization occurred during the Roman Gaul and Frank era. During the Briton emigration to Brittany, several Christian missionaries from Wales came in the region and founded dioceses. They are known as the Seven Founder Saints. I wonder if this has anything to do with the Seven Ravens mythology. The patron saint of Brittany is St. Anne, the Virgin's mother, whom I discussed in my previous video. The name Vlad reminds me of Vlad the Impaler. Vlad was the voivode or leader of Wallachia. Wallachia is derived from the term Walhaz, used by Germanic peoples to describe Celts, later Romanized Celts, and all Gallo-Roman-speaking people. In northwestern Europe this gave rise to Wales, Cornwall, and Wallonia, all related to Brittany. This is the flag of Wallachia, featuring the raven, or a hybrid eagle raven, and what looks like an oak tree. Alan the steward, or Alan Fitzwalter, was the son and heir of Walter Fitzalan. Alan served as steward of Scotland, or Dapifer, to William the, William the Lion, King of Scots. He allegedly accompanied Richard the Lionheart on the Third Crusade, from which he returned to Scotland in July 1191. He erected Rothsay Castle on the island of Butte. To me, this, this looks like a Disney historical prop, and I doubt it was ever inhabited. Alan Fitzwalter became patron of the Knights Templar and is responsible for expanding Templar influence in Scotland. Charles is the Duke of Rothsay as well as Duke of Cornwall and Prince of Wales. Is it Prince Charles who will be crowned King of the World? We shall see. Somehow the name Charles seems to be connected to the ideal of royal usurpation by, quote, the power behind the throne, unquote. The steward becomes king reminds me of another similar royal usurpation that of Charles Martel and the Carolingians. As mayor of the palace, Charles Martel was the de facto ruler of Francia from 718 until his death in 741. Under the Merovingian dynasty, the mayor of the palace, or majordomo, or seneschal, was the manager of the household of the Frankish king and the true power behind the throne. After the reign of Dagobert in 
39, the Merovingians effected, effectively ceded power to the mayors of the palace, who ruled the Frankish realm. They controlled the royal treasury, dispensed patronage, and granted large, uh, granted land and privileges in the name of the figurehead king. Charles's father, Pepin of Herstal, was the first to call himself Duke and Prince of the Franks, a tit title later taken up by Charles. In 751, the mayor of the palace, Pepin the Short, Charles's son, orchestrated the deposition of the king, Childeric III, and was crowned in his place. He was the first of the Carolingian dynasty to become king. I don't know if any of this is true, of course. Fake history is as prevalent as fake news. But this is the narrative. Charles's grandson, Charlemagne, extended the Frankish realms and became the first emperor in the West since the fall of Rome in the year 800. He is also known as King of the Lombards. The Lombards are an interesting group. The name literally means Longbeards. And, in the Middle English, the, world, the word meant banker or money changer or pawnbroker usurer and coward. There is also a gender-bending cross-dressing cross theme in the creation myth of the Lombards. The story goes like this. The Lombards were originally called the Winili tribe of southern Scandinavia and dwelt on the extreme border of Gaul, where they came into terri territorial dispute dispute with the Vandals. The god Odin promised that he would give the victory to those whom he would see first at sunrise. Outnumbered by the Vandals, the goddess Freya advised that all Winili women should tie their hair in front of their faces like beards and march in line with their husbands. Looking out his east-facing window at dawn, Odin asks his wife, Who are these long beards? And Freya replied, My lord, thou hast given them the name, now give them also the victory. Odin is, of course, a raven god. These are his two raven spies, Hugin and Munin, Old Norse, for thought and memory. And let us not forget that today Lombardy in northern Italy is the European epicenter of the crown virus. I just have to wonder if the high steward of Scotland and the mayor of the palace weren't eunuchs, as in servants of the royal household. Courtiers and high government officials were often eunuchs. Castration made them reliable servants of the royal court where physical access to the ruler could wield great influence, which could in theory give a eunuch the ruler's ear, and impart de facto power on the formerly humble but trusted servant. Here's the royal coat of arms of the United Kingdom. I got this from a website called jawtruth.net and it's discussing British Israelism, which clearly requires more research, but I'm just going to put this out here right now. The unicorn is scriptural code language. Horn is code word for kingdom. Unicorn symbolizes the unique horn, one kingdom, world without end, God's kingdom on earth. Could it possibly be unicorn? The unicorn, or wild ox, the angle, let's see, has the crown of Israel around its neck so that it's not possible to remove it. The crown is chained to the words mondroit, which means my right, and refer refers to the birthright given to Ephraim, which, like the crown to which it and the unicorn, 
is chained can never be removed from Ephraim, the Angelish. The lion rampant represents the house of Judah, wearing a crown that can and will be removed when Shiloh from Ephraim takes his rightful British throne. Soon from the house of Windsor, which is, like Elizabeth II, descended from the house of Judah and the house, the royal line of David. Like I said, this is going to require some more research, but it is rather interesting. And you can read this for yourself, a little more etymology. Let's have a closer look at the name Charles. It means man. The popularity of the name in continental Europe was due to the fame of Charles the Great, or Charlemagne, king of the Franks, who came to rule m over most of Europe. Let's see. The name did not become common in Britain until the 17th century when it was borne by the Stuart kings, the Stuart king Charles I. It had been introduced into the Stuart royal family by Mary, Queen of Scots, who had been raised in France. Here we have Henry Stuart, Lord Darnley, Duke of Albany, the king consort of Scotland, as he was married to Mary, Queen of Scots, a tutor. They are the parents of James I and VI, of King James' Bible fame. Here's King James I and VI. The name Charles was introduced to Great Britain by Mary, Queen of Scots, who bestowed it upon her son, James Charles Stuart. His son and grandson both ruled as King Charles. Young Charles I and his parents, King James I and Queen Anne of Denmark, circa 1612. This is the execution of King Charles I outside of the banqueting house at Whitehall. At the end of the English Civil War, Charles was tried, convicted, and executed for high treason in 1649. The monarchy was abolished, and the Commonwealth of England was established as a republic under Oliver Cromwell. The monarchy would be restored to Charles's son, Charles II, in 1660 on Apple Oak Day, or Oak Apple Day, May 29th. Will we witness very soon another restoration of the monarchy under another Charles? I'm going to wrap it up here, but just to give you an idea of what's coming up in the next video, we return to the Tower of London's kept clipped ravens. There is an even earlier origin myth as to the ravens in the tower, and it has to do with the Welsh hero god Bran the Blessed, or Bandigaedfran. I'll just read this. Mythology is something of a passion of mine, you know. There are legends which link ravens with the White Hill back to the time of the ancient Britons, even before the Romans, long before the tower was built. The Mabinogion recounts that a severed head of Bran the Blessed was buried beneath the spot, and I'm sure you know Bran means both king and raven. And while some insist that the idea is a modern invention, I've read far too many accounts dating back centuries that mention a flock of ravens residing here. Not flock, Miss Goad, an unkindness. Thanks for sticking with me thus far, and we'll see you in part two.